Chapel Roan has become a topic that is impossible to ignore. From her hit Good Luck Bay to her absolutely shredding it during festival season to her actually calling out our fans for their creepy behavior and snapping back at paparazzi during the VMAs, it's impossible to miss what this artist has been about this year. Chapel Roan has been making music for 10 years now, but in 2024 her career has been going at like 300 kilometers per hour. And now it's fair to say that I think almost everyone has heard about her in a way or another. And although you'd think this is a dream come true, this very fast rise to fame has come with its fair share of problems. And we're going to talk about this today. We're going to have a little conversation, you and I. Chapel Rowan seems to be quite set on her boundaries and aware of her self-worth as an artist and an individual. And oh boy, this is something that the internet and people in general can't handle from women, especially if the woman is a young woman. And especially if the woman is a young queer woman. Oh my oh my. Toxic people are pressed right now. They are pressed. Like the critics are going like in every single direction. It is hard to keep up, but we're going to try and talk about some of them. I won't cover everything because there is so much discourse on her right now, but we're going to talk. The craziest part is that right now, in the timeline that Chapel Rune has become huge celebrity, which is an extremely short timeline, she has done objectively nothing wrong. Like she's an artist that is very focused on her art, she platforms people in the LGBT community, she inspires the LGBT youth, she seems to be extremely hardworking. she's even turned down a collab with H&M and I don't know if you realize how huge this is from an artist today. So honestly right now to me it just looks like people are trying to find reasons to hate on a newly successful young woman. So today let me reintroduce you to Chapel Ruin and the country controversies that she has been in lately. Sit down comfortably, I hope you have a nice cup of coffee with you or tea or whatever, you can even be sipping Prosecco if you want when you're watching my videos. I'm your host Leo, I talk about music, musicians, their career, their albums, I do music reactions, so if you don't want to miss any of that and my future videos, you can follow me right now and activate the bell. And now let's get started. So let me start by giving you a little timeline of the career of Chapel Roan. Chapel Roan is a 26-year-old artist from Missouri in the US. She adopted the stage name Chapel Roan in 2016 as a tribute to her grandfather that was named Dennis K. Chapel and his favorite song, The Strawberry Roan by Carly Fletcher. Chapel Roan started music early. She used to sing in front of her parents and grandparents and they encouraged her to pursue music. In 2015, at only 17 years old, she was signed by Atlantic Records after performing showcases in New York and releasing original songs on her YouTube channel. In 2017, she released her EP School Nights and in 2017 and 2018, she toured with Vance Joyne and Declan McKenna. So a career start that seemed like a dream for someone so young. But this dream turned sour in 2020 when Atlantic Records dropped her after the songs she released were not profitable enough. One of these songs include Pink Pony Club. Later in the video I'm going to talk about Chapel Rowan's interview with Rolling Stones. And in the Rolling Stones article they mentioned that Atlantic Records declined making a comment on this for the article and no shit. Can you imagine fumbling the bag that hard? And I know that Atlantic Records is having a lot of problems this year. Maybe it could have saved your label to keep trusting into Chapel Room. I don't know, I'm not a professional, I guess. In 2020, her ex-boyfriend also broke up with her and she moved back to Missouri to live with her parents, had to dad the pandemic and it was a pretty shitty year for her. Despite all of these difficulties, like her song Pink Pony Club was praised by many media. So even though sometimes you see a song that works quite well, it doesn't mean that the artist is doing well. So make sure to invest in your favorite artist. If you want to see them continue their career. But anyway, despite these difficulties, she decided to keep doing 
music independently and to go all in on her pop project. And she was really set on completely embracing the drag culture and dressing as a drag queen and taking inspirations from drag shows and really wanting to have fun with her project. In the comment section with Drew Afwalo, she commented, I dedicated my project to honoring my inner child. That's when it started working. In October 2020, she moved back to LA and she was working job in order to make her music independently. 2020 was a big year for her. In February, she signed a publishing deal with Sony and she was a supporting act for Olivia Rodrigo on the Sour Tour. That year, she also released Feminenomenon and Casual. Feminenomenon is a mouthful. I love it. <laughs> in 2023, she had her debut tour, Naked in North America tour, and she really took time to craft a special concert experience for the fans, suggesting outfits for the fans to match her own camp outfits. And she had drag queens open for her tour. At the end of 2023, she released her album, The Rise and Fall of a Midwest Princess, and she started her Midwest Princess tour through North America, Europe, and Australia, and she kept opening her shows with drag queens. Her album wasn't an immediate huge commercial success, but as you're going to see, her success throughout 2024 made the album rise. <laughs> 2024 is the year of Chapel Room. It has only sped up more and more. From February to April, she opened for Olivia Rodrigo's Guts World Tour. In February, she appeared on The Late Show with Stephen Colbert. In March, she did her Tiny Desk concert, a video that now has more than 7 million views on YouTube, so this contributed to like platform her even more. In April, she released a new song for her next chapter, Good Luck Babe. It's fair to say that this song has made her completely explode. Good Luck Babe is her first song to reach the top 10 on the Billboard Hot 100. It really drew a lot of attention to her and to her music and people were curious, so they started to listen to her, the rise and fall of a Midwest princess. It made the album reach number two on the Billboard 200 right below Taylor Swift. We went from being unknown to like, being right below Taylor Swift on the billboard. That is enormous. In April, she performed at Coachella. In June, she performed at the Governor's Ball Music Festival. In June, she also performed at the Bonnaroo Music Festival, where she was moved to a bigger tent than the organizers previously planned due to the high rise of the men to see her perform. In June, she also starred on The Tonight Show starring Jimmy Fallon. And in August, she performed at Lollapalooza, where she drew the biggest daytime crowd ever seen at the festival. So think about all of this, turning from an artist that works independently does most of her glam, her work, her music. Like, you are working hard doing everything. You are starting to be more known. Then suddenly you have this extremely fast rise in fame and everybody wants to have you on their show. Everybody listens to your music. It's a lot of attention. It's really intense. Some of the very big things that happened this year, she shared that she was gaining hundreds of thousands of followers per day on her social media. She entered the Billboard Hot 100 for the first time. She entered the Billboard 200 with her first album. And pretty much every single queer celebrity, I think, has reached out to her. But as I said, this is an intensely fast rise to fame, and it is coming with its fair share of problems. Like the concert dates that she cancelled in order to perform at the VMAs, or the TikTok video she made to snap back at her fans and express her boundaries regarding to fame. Because this fame has gone with now people being extremely focused on her. Some people have been behaving in an extremely unhinged way when they encountered her in public. Some people have doxxed her parents' numbers. Some people know where her sister work and have followed her sister. It has been a lot. So we are going to talk about all of this. But first, I am going to share my opinion on Chapel Room. First things first, I think it's really important that an artist as Chapel Rune is exploding right now. Yes, we have the pop music, the colorful performances, but it's much more than that. We are seeing a lesbian perform drag culture and platform drag queens in a time when her country is trying 
to take away rights from people in the LGBT plus community. A time when the US is trying to ban drug culture under the guise of protecting children, but really mostly because patriarchy is threatened by people in the LGBT community having basic human rights. As we speak, lives of people from the LGBT plus community are threatened, their physical integrity is threatened. It's overwhelming and depressing, but it's important to acknowledge it. I'm getting emotional, I have a hard time talking about this topic, but I'm going to keep going. The state of the rights of people from the LGBT plus community are so bad overall in the world, and we've had some progress in the last decades in the Western world, but we are becoming so regressive right now, it's really depressing. And we like to twist this in many ways, but threatening the rights of people from the LGBT plus community is a human rights violation. And you can try to justify that all you want, it's just going to come down to you being okay justifying human rights violations. So having one of the most successful artists in the world right now be a less that is platforming drag culture is so important. She is literally going on tour and giving to drag queens a place to exist physically. It is so important and it's not easy, make no mistake. My girl is really out there advocating for human rights. She even declined going to the White House for the Pride celebration because of their stance on transgender rights and the Palestinian genocide. coming for her throat right now are missing a huge part of the context of her work and what she is doing directly and indirectly as an artist. She also seems to be someone that is really true to her core values, which is something that I appreciate. We don't know how this is going to turn in the future, but we're talking about what is happening right now. In the interview, she says that she's not going to do anything that doesn't serve the music. All the money goes to the world building. H&M does not fit in this world also H&M. No amount of money is going to make me consider working with anyone, it has to be a hundred percent right. And in a time when a lot of artists are sacrificing their integrity for money, this is incredible! Incredible to see, like wow. I also love that she has a strong personality. As I said in the introduction of this video, Chapel Roan is an artist that seems adamant about setting boundaries, she knows what she wants and she also has a strong sense of who she is and her worth and this is something that makes a lot of people uncomfortable. She has also shared that she has bipolar 2 disorder which doesn't make it really easy for her to navigate the world I'm sure. She's been open about the medication that she's been taking and about seeing her therapist a lot, contributing to talking about mental health which is really important. I've seen a lot of people call her out actually for talking about mental health and trying to set boundaries with her fans and overall trying to set boundaries as a famous celebrity. I've seen a lot of bad faith, I've seen a lot of oh I'm afraid she doesn't have what it takes, she chose the wrong industry, this generation of artists is so soft, like you know what, I would rather have annoying celebrities who are soft rather than a generation of celebrities that are completely addicted to drugs or who are killing themselves, like do y'all not remember Club 27? Is that really what you want? Because personally, that's not what I want. And we are only going to get away from that if we have artists that draw boundaries as celebrities. And the last piece of opinion I have on Chapel Grown is that her music is really fun. I had Good Luck Babe in my playlist ever since April. And in the beginning of September, I started listening to the rise and fall of a Midwest princess. And honestly, it's good pop music. It's really fun. And you know, it tells a story which is so funny for me, like this is what I prefer in albums. One of my favorite albums of all time is Preacher's Daughter by Ethel Kane and I really crave album which tells stories and I don't think that 
think we have a lot of that today. So the rise and fall of Midwest Princess was a really good listening experience. So here it is, a little summary of my opinion on Chapel Run. Now let's talk about the problems and controversies that have risen with her very fast rise to fame. Not to spoil my argumentation, but if I had to sum up the controversies revolving around Chapel Run recently, I think I'd say people don't know how to handle themselves. Some people want to bank on her success, some people don't know how to respect artists until they've risen to a certain level of financial success, and then you have the fans who don't know how to behave normally. And basically it's just a mix of oh my god! And between all of that you have an overwhelmed artist. In her Rolling Stones interview she shared Part of me has I never have a hit again because then no one will ever expect anything from me again. Which is not normal. So I really want to address the problems with the fans. And I'm going to address the situation backwards. First, let's talk about the two TikTok videos she has posted on her account addressing the behavior of her fans. I need you to answer questions. Just answer my questions for a second. If you saw a random woman on the street would you yell at her from the car window? Would you harass her in public? Would you go up to a random lady and say, can I get a photo with you? And she's like, no, what the fuck? And then you get mad at this random lady? Um, would you be offended if she says no to your time because she has her own time? Would you, would you stalk her family? Would you follow her around? Would you try to dissect her life and bully her online. This is a lady you don't know. Um, and she doesn't know you at all. Would you assume that she's a good person? Assume she's a bad person? Would you assume everything you read about her online is true? I'm a random bitch. You're a random bitch. Just think about that for a second, okay? I don't care that abuse and harassment, stalking, whatever, is a normal thing to do to people who are um, famous or a little famous, whatever. I don't care that it's normal. I don't care that this crazy type of behavior comes along with the job, the career field I've chosen. That does not make it okay. That doesn't make it normal. I don't, it doesn't mean I want it. It doesn't mean that I like it. I don't want whatever the fuck you think you're supposed to be entitled to whenever you see a celebrity. I don't give a fuck if you think it's selfish of me to say no for a photo or for your time or to for a hug. That's not normal. That's weird. It's weird how people think that you know a person just because you see them online or you listen to the art they make. That's fucking weird. I'm allowed to say no to creepy behavior. Okay. After these videos, she has received a lot of support from other celebrities who identified with what she was sharing. There's also been a lot of fans and people who are understanding of her message. But we've had a huge portion of people who have been displaying such bad faith, it's not even funny. Overall, on the internet, even when you're not out there like trying to draw boundaries or like try to defend yourself, people seem really set on waiting to jump at your throat or like wanting to teach you a lesson and put you back in your place. And it's a very toxic and annoying atmosphere, but I really think that it is big right now. Like this is what I sometimes am feeling as a content creator, especially when I post on TikTok. Also, women trying to draw boundaries is often seen as entitled because People see women and even more famous women as public property. So why would our shared property try to draw boundaries and be herself and belong to herself and take away me possessing a piece of her? It's happening to famous women now, but it's also overall a shared sentiment regarding women in general. A woman drawing boundaries is seen as a bitch. But if you felt offended by her video, you might need to reflect. And you might need to take a look at how entitled you feel 
to others. In these videos, she is addressing two types of fans. The first type is the fans who feel entitled to her and to her time. It's the fans that are going to meet her in public and who will want to take a picture or who will want to talk to her. But as she said, when she's not performing or working on the music, she sees it as being plucked out of her job and enjoying her personal time, which is very reasonable, I would think. This is still time that you're giving to others and I think it's up to the artist to decide whether or not they want to have these casual interactions. But if you're tired, having a bad day or it's your only day off, I think it's very understandable that you would want to have some time to yourself or with your friends or family. But in my opinion, it's the fans in this category that have been displaying the most bad faith on the internet. I've seen a lot of comments like, oh wow, so asking for a picture is stalking. This all comes with being a celebrity, you should accept that. But think about it, with her rise to fame and now the number of people who know her and the number of people who could recognize her, like, can you imagine navigating the public space with such a reality downing on you? This would be overwhelming for any Anybody. And what she's saying in the video is true. To you, to me, she's a random lady. And you wouldn't feel entitled to a random lady in the streets. You know what we call people who feel entitled to women's space in public? Creeps. But many of these fans didn't like that she addressed them and the type number two that I'm going to talk about in just a few seconds. And this is why they displayed bad faith. But really, if you watch the video, it's really clear that she's addressing two different kinds of fans. The second type of fans that she is addressing in this video is the dangerous fans. And oh my God, in the Rolling Stones article, she is like describing some incidents that have happened to her recently and it is unhinged. In the article, she shares that she has a stalker, someone that she met back in misery. This person has shown up to her parents' home and to her hotel room in New York. So now she has to have security with her. The only reason why this is not turning tragic is because now she has the money to have security. She also describes incidents of fans sharing her flight information, going to the airport to see her. Don't do that. Do can threaten her security once again. She also talks about like one dude who berated her until the security showed up. She's also talking about when she was celebrating uh, the birthday of one of her friends in August and someone grabbed her and kissed her. Did I miss a train of craziness? I don't know. And people like shared the phone number of her dad. If you're doing all of this, just know that I am judging you super hard right now. And this is coming from someone who used to be obsessed with Five Seconds of Summer and I would like write fan fictions about them, but this ended when I was 15 and like this never spilled into harassment or anything. Like be a fan, have fun, but oh my God. Oh my god. She really snapped and posted these two TikToks because people showed up at her sister's workplace and leaked her dad's phone number. Just put yourself in her shoes. Like, if someone was messing with my family, I don't care if it's a fan, I am going to snap. If you mess with my family, you will be in the enemy category. So it's no wonder that she is really snapping and annoyed at her fans right now. I think that most of the people watching this video are going to be in the chill section and agree. I know that a lot of people are set on the entitlement to her time when she's out there in public because she's a celebrity. But I really thought about that myself and I have a, like an analogy, an example that I want to share. I'm especially going to talk to women here because men won't be able to identify with the situation, but I'm still going to share it. If I take my personal experience, I live in Paris. I cannot go outside even for a few minutes without undergoing some sort of harassment, which is going to go from extremely soft harassment, meaning just like men looking at me in a creepy way or men catcalling me on the good days. And sometimes it's worse, honestly. Sometimes when I stare back at the men who stare at me, they get mad and I've already had 
several men scream at me in public just to tell you how comfortable they are to scream at women like in public once i didn't move out of the way for a man in the streets and he kicked my leg or like when i was a teenager i've already had men follow me in the streets so here are a very broad spectrum of harassment but honestly like even just going out and having men stare at you, it's really annoying and it's nothing but it weighs down on you mentally. Like going out and really honestly the other day I went to the pharmacy uh, because I need, needed medicine. I had one man stare at me creepily for one minute and one man cat called me but I was out in the streets for three minutes because it's a very short walk. This is insane. And don't take it as me being like, oh my God, I get so much attention. Ah, when I'm out in the street, I'm a regular Jane. I never, like I'm put together for the camera. When I'm out in the streets, it's mostly to go to the grocery store or to run errands. I don't dress up. Honestly, I look like a rat sometimes. And it's not just me. Any woman I've talked to, no matter her age has gone, under some sort of harassment in Paris. And it really does not matter where they belong on the socially agreed on attractiveness scale or where they belong on the male gaze stare or the male gaze beauty scale. No matter where they are on these spectrums, they've undergone some sort of harassment in public. So I cannot even imagine what it's like when you are a celebrity and it's from your fans or even from people who are not your fans but people who know you're famous and just want to give you a bad time but even if it's just the addition of people with good intentions who just want a little bit of your time because they love you of course you don't come with bad intention but some people do and you have to be vigilant because you don't know like in which category the fan is going to fall at the end of your interaction and also sometimes you're overwhelmed you don't have the time. It can very much turn into a danger for you. I know that 99% of us are regular Joes who are nice and meaning well and just excited to see the celebrity. But we are a crowd. And if she meets 50 regular Joes into one or two hour, it's going to be tiring and overwhelming. And then there is the chance that we are going to be the 1% dangerous creep. And you know, honestly, this is nerve wracking and it's also understandable that this is not a risk that a celebrity would want to take. As I said, a lot of celebrities supported her. After her TikToks, she posted another post on Instagram to kind of explain further what she meant and especially to respond to the backlash that happened after the TikToks. Shawn Mendes and Hayley Williams shared her post in their stories, approving the message and mainly celebrities liked her post and showed her support. I really liked this post on the Chapel Rowan subreddit. The person is seeing something that really stood out to me was her calling out predatory behavior disguised as super fan behavior. This was actually really high opening to me. Sometimes you will hear a story about something like a female barista at Starbucks who has a regular who starts talking to them, finding out personal information, thinking they know everything about them, thinking they will be in a romantic relationship with this person. We call this person a stalker, a predator, a harasser, delusional, dangerous. We encourage the woman in this story to call the police and get a restraining order. So why is it that just because someone is famous this behavior is now labeled as okay instead of what it really is? Imagine telling that young female barista that no actually, they should be flattered by the attention. They're only doing this because he just likes how she makes a coffee in that if you give them attention they will be satisfied and go away. I can't imagine how invalidating and horrible this would be. I'm so glad Chapel has started this conversation and I hope the people who feel angry and called out by her post take a look at why they feel that way and change their behavior. When you go to the media post reporting the news about her trying to draw boundaries with her fan, you have a lot of people in the comments displaying a lot of bad faith and honestly, there's a lot of men. We have to be honest about that. A lot of the worst comments that I've read on this topic are from men, honestly, which is surprising because men are usually very good at being respectful with women's boundaries. Then another problem that has occurred is that 
with the huge surge of fame that she's been getting and the attention that she has gotten, she has been nominated in several categories at the VMAs and she had to cancel her Paris and Amsterdam show and to reschedule some of her Berlin shows, I think, in order to have the time to rehearse for the VMAs and go there. And some fans have been felt left aside in this whole situation. First of all, she was nominated, so she would have been seen in a bad light by her peers and by a lot of people in the industry if she had snubbed the VMAs, despite the fact that she was nominated there for the first time. This is also a huge opportunity for her. I understand why she is excited for this, and I know that some fans feel left out, but you know, this is such a huge and great opportunity for her. It would have been silly not going there. Yes, the early fans, they're like the early investors in the artist's career and they are the ones who end up like making them small and middle and big. Then the artists are going to get bigger opportunities. Would you have skipped the VMAs? I'm not sure, you know. Artists also need to see the bigger picture for their career and if sometimes they make moves that make them lose some fans, given the fact that they can be in situations where get, they are getting a huge surge of new fans, you know, this is a balance that they have to go for. And yes, it would be nice to favor nurturing your early fans, but this is not always possible. And, you know, concerts are events at the end of the day and events get scheduled and cancelled all the time for a diversity of reasons. Honestly, this is completely fair that you'd be upset that the show is cancelled, but because of some people who are honestly really delusional and entitled online, a lot of the fans who were disappointed looked like clowns just because of this minority of really entitled people. When an event gets cancelled, you get refunded. This is absolutely normal. Some people are out there demanding that they also get refunded for their transportation, their accommodation. But I'm sorry, if you are traveling to go see an artist, the artist is not responsible for that. I went to see Taylor in Amsterdam in July. With my friends, we paid for an Airbnb. I bought train tickets. If she had canceled, I would have been sad, rightfully so, but we would have spent the weekend in Amsterdam with my friends. I made the financial decisions to do that. This was my responsibility. This was not Taylor's swift. Taylor Swift's responsibility. It's okay to be pissed and to vent to your friends. It's okay to be like sad and express it on social media. But like, just don't tweet and demand that Chapel Room reimburses your plane ticket. I don't know. Also, European fans, you have to understand that to the artist in the US, we are just another continent. All right. They are never going to prioritize another continent. <laughs> I saw this tweet, like responding to a tweet about um, the scheduling conflict and having to cancel the dates in Paris and Amsterdam. Someone said, oh, scheduling conflicts is always a pretty way of saying we found something more interesting for my career than a little European show. If they have bigger opportunities artists in the US are not going to favor doing a show in Europe. But you know what you can do about it? You can support groups from Europe. There are so many of them. And also let's remember that it's not like it was a fun decision to take for her. Let me read you this section of the Rolling Stones article. It says, in June, in the middle of headlining set in Raleigh, North America, Rowan broke down between tears. Rowan told the audience she feels a little off today because of how fast our career was moving. I was trying so hard to do the theater kid thing and just be like, push through, be the character. She explains, I was worried of letting people down after they've seen these videos of me fucking serving. I was not serving that day and I had to be honest. Overall, Chapel Rune's rise to fame, the schedule problem that it caused, her calling out her fans for being disrespectful or even dangerous, and people's response to that is opening a more important and broader conversation around parasocial relationships. Let us go back to a definition. Parasocial relationships are one-sided relationships where one person extends emotional energy 
interest and time and the other party, the persona, is completely unaware of the other person's existence. This was a definition from Find A Psychologist. Dictionary.com answers what does parasocial relationship mean. The term parasocial relationship refers to a relationship that a person imagines having with another person whom they do not actually know, such as a celebrity or a fictional character. This often involves a person feeling as though they have a close, intimate connection with someone whom they have never met due to closely following that person or character in media such as TV shows, videos, podcasts, etc. So there is a very important element here one person does not know that the other person in the relationship exists. So if you are this other person at the end of this relationship, I think it's important to ask yourselves these questions. Are you a fan of the art or are you a fan of the artist? Can you enjoy the art without the artist? Do you need to put someone on a pedestal to appreciate their art? For example, I'm often challenged in that because I have a hard time really supporting artists that do not have the same values as me. But at the same time, I cannot demand that these people support the same causes as I do. And it's my responsibility to manage where I put my energy and my money. And it is like my responsibility to deal with myself when I do it imperfectly according to my moral compass. Even though I believe that it's important to demand people in position of power to not do objectively terrible things. But at the end of the day, who I grant power and money and attention is my responsibility. Also, I'm someone who likes to indulge in celebrity crushes. And I've been thinking about this a lot and I theorized something in my head a while back and today I want to share that with you. This is really something that I theorized. Feel free to tell me what you think about it. I am really curious about your opinion on that. If you have a celebrity crush, like if I have a celebrity crush, I am aware that it is on the third layer. What is the third layer you're going to ask me? And I would be happy to answer you. Let's take a celebrity. You have layer number one. Layer number one is the person it's the person that you actually don't know, they likely live in a different city or maybe even a different country. You will probably never meet them and I'm gonna hold your hand when I say this. There is such a high chance that you and them would not get along if you met because you are two completely different person. And even if you like their art, there is a variety of reasons why you probably wouldn't get along as individuals. Then you have layer two. This person crafts an artistic or public persona or both. They are going to write it. It is both an unconscious and conscious process and a lot of work goes into it from the celebrity and from their team. Their speech is crafted by their PR team. What they convey in their music or on their social media is often tailored by these PR teams. What they convey in their music is going to be validated by some people at some point in the chain. What they convey on their social media or in interviews is going to be validated and crafted by PR teams. Then you have to add on to that the way other media are going to talk about these celebrities to either follow the PR team's crafted briefs or to push their own political agendas or the general visions they want the public to follow. Every single piece of an artist you get was thought through, crafted and conveyed in a way that would ensure that you would thought they were interesting. And I'm not saying this like it's a, something negative, it's just a truth. Artist wants to convey art and a message through it. Their team wants to make sure that they get as much money as they can out of this. And the media wants to use their name in order to make money and have people click on their article. Even me, like, I tried to have a shocking title in this video to make sure that you would click on it. So we have layer two. It is packed, a lot of work goes into layer two. So then you have layer three. Layer three is the persona that you craft in your mind from everything that I have mentioned in the layer two. In layer three, you are the one doing the work. From everything that you've seen from the celebrity, you are going to pick and choose all of the pieces of information that you want to remember, those you want to ignore. So it puts together a person that does not exist 
anywhere outside of your own mind. And I know it sounds very ominous, but this is basically the definition of the parasocial relationship. And honestly, this is where you can have fun, take this the light way and enjoy this layer three. But you just have to remember that layer one and layer three are so far away from each other. Layer three does not exist. So if you ever encounter layer one, remember that it's not the same. And if you see them in public, don't go harass them or assume that they also know you. You must assume that it's a complete blank page. When you see layer one, like erase layer three from your mind. Assume that they also know you. You must assume that it's a complete blank page. When you see layer one, like erase layer free from your mind. And here is the last thing that I want to talk about. This is the last section of this video, but I really think that these intense parasocial relationships that are foreign are going to encourage the way people want to see those who rise to fame as toys who should be thankful, especially the people who rise in the industries without like having privileges previously or without being nepo based bees or without having like obvious connections. There's a comment on uh, Chapel Run subreddit that I really liked. The well you choose to be famous line is just an absolute excuse for people to wave off bad behavior because they think it's how fan culture is. I've seen so many comments of oh she's not gonna last in the industry like it's a slight against Chapel, but to me that just screams there is a problem with everything else and how it is now. This attitude is also heavily misogynistic. Chapel Rowan hasn't been soft in the way she called out her fans, but we have to remember that people don't let women be bitchy. Women only get to be thankful for what we allowed them to have and what we granted them, as if they had never played a role in what they got with their own work. When someone becomes famous, there are a lot of positive outcomes. People get interested in you, you get opportunities in your industry that you would not have access to previously, you get more money, you get access to more luxury and means. It's overly positive. There are downsides to becoming famous, but in this economy, I'm not going to sit here and pretend that Becoming a celebrity is overly negative and that celebrity have it harder than the average citizen, all right? This is not what I want to say. So this balance is very positive. And even the negative, the thing is that the celebrities are often going to have the means to compensate that. And I've been thinking about this a lot and I've come to a sort of conclusion that here I would really like to have your opinion. I think that for a lot of people seeing someone rise to fame and get all of these positive outcomes is going to spark a lot of jealousy. This can be because you see someone living your dream or simply because you are seeing someone get access to financial security in a way that you might never have access to. Or if you're a fan and you contributed to the artist's early rise to fame, you can feel that the efforts you put into them becoming famous are not rewarded. And I think that for some people, it is sparking a desire to have a form of revenge on these celebrities or like a desire to see them pay or suffer the consequences. Like they should leave negative consequences to balance out all the positive that they're living and that you'll never get access to. And I think that, yeah, some people are actively or passively in this mindset and this can spill into their behavior online or in their behavior with the celebrity. This is why we need to be careful with ourselves and the parasocial relationships that we develop, both for our own peace of mind and also to not create dangerous situation for the artists. It is now time for me to end this video. I really liked diving into Chapel Run's universe and I'm also happy that I started to talk about like parasocial relationship and like 
my little fairy of layer one, two, three, because I've been thinking about that a lot, especially as someone who's a fan of like a lot of people. So what I'd like you to take away from this video is that it's okay and it can even be super positive for you to love an artist and take a lot of comfort and inspiration into their art and into their artistic persona. We need fun, we need some things to enjoy and have a nice time. Just remember that you don't know these people and that layer one and layer three are two very different things. At the end of the day, one of the main things you have in common with them is that you love them. Uh, this is not the most healthy ground for a relationship. <laughs> also remember that the music industry at the end of the day is an industry that is there to make money for some executives and artists and their team treat it as an industry because they have to. It's a business for them too, even though the end goal for the artist is to share their art. And remember Remember that when you are putting your money on the table, it's transactional and you are agreeing to certain risks. So when you buy a concert ticket, it might get cancelled. So be careful with the expenses that you are going to do. Purchasing merch or concert tickets is not going to mean that you are going to get access to the artist directly or that they should give you more time. It means that you're going to see a great concert or you're going to have a nice sweat. Concerts are events and they require a lot of things to go right in order to happen, so sometimes they get cancelled. Also, parasocial relationships can have a negative impact on both parties involved. So as a fan, take all the positive you get, but you are also better off not investing too much emotions into this relationship that is not going to reward you on an equal basis. Make sure that you don't often end up disappointed because of that, because I'm not sure it's going to end up having a positive impact on your personal image. Like any escape, a parasocial relationship can turn into something very sour or even dangerous. Regarding Chapel Run, she has a lot of things planned for the future, given what she were reported in the Rolling Stones article, like we've seen that she's going to take a break from December to May to write music, but she has shared that she has already six music written, probably for her next album, so this is really exciting. We're going to get more fun pop songs, we're going to get more queer artists on stage, we're going to get more inspiration for our queer youth. It's a blast. I can't wait to see what's next for her. I hope that the boundaries that she is setting are going to help her navigate celebrity as well as she can and that it's going to help her give us the best art that she can. This video is now over. If you want to support me, you can like it, leave a comment, tell me what you thought about everything that I've talked about in this video. Don't forget to subscribe and activate the bell. And if you want to see more content from me, you have all my YouTube videos you can follow me on TikTok, I share short form videos on there and on Instagram I just post my regular photos and private stuff so if you want to see some of that you can follow me. If you want to go the extra mile I have a Patreon that I am structuring right now but you can already go to the smallest tier and support me if you want. I was your host Leo, this was my take on Chapel Rose's very fast rise to fame and I will see you very soon.